Superman, Speeding Bullets comic explored in detail. Playing with two of DC's most iconic characters and putting them together, that was the primary idea behind J.M. DeMattis and Eduardo Barreto's one-shot comic book, Superman, Speeding Bullets. Published back in 1993 and released as a 52-page prestige format standalone issue, the comic book was also a recipient of the Comic Buyer's Guide Fan Award in the very year it was released. In case you didn't know, this comic book here is an amalgamation of two superheroes, one who is faster than a speed and bullet, and one who has an arsenal of technology capable of humiliating most armies for that matter. No points for guessing that we are categorically talking about Superman and Batman here. Now, we all know the backstories of these superheroes, but has this ever crossed your mind that what would have happened if kal spacecraft had landed in Gotham City instead of Kansas and he was raised by the Wings instead of the Kents? Well, for those who have and also for those who haven't, here's a graphic novel that we will be exploring thoroughly today. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you, and let's begin. You better be ready for this. The Dawn of a New Age, Superman Speed and Bullets, Complete Issue Explained. The issue begins with a rocket gliding through space and making its way towards Earth. Of course, the people back on the planet are bound to have observed the shooting star, but unbeknownst to them, it was more like the dawn of a new age. While there was a possibility of that rocket to have landed anywhere in the world, all thanks to the fluctuating wind current, it crash landed in Gotham City and was discovered by Thomas Wayne along with his wife, Martha. The duo, who were on their way upstate to the governor's campaign dinner, were both staggered and thrilled at the same time to discover a baby inside. It goes without saying that the couple always desired a child and they wasted no time in taking baby Cal L in. For a woman who fancied her social life in Gotham as much as Thomas did, both were well aware that their days of party and charity ball events had all come to a halt. Now, everything revolved around Wayne Manor. That was their world. Naming the child Bruce, the couple began to raise him up as their own. Of course, Thomas had his own theories regarding the origin of Bruce and where he came from, but Martha, Bruce was his son and that is all that mattered. They loved him unconditionally, taught him values, and shaped both his soul as well as mind. It did not take Thomas Wayne much time to figure out how powerful kal -El was. He was quick, he was agile, and never did he for once have a broken bone or even a scratch for that matter. What worried Thomas more was his child's mental capacities and he often told his son that people who are cowards and bullies are the ones who resort to violence, further stating to his son that he must always aspire to something better and higher. However, even with the copious amounts of attention that Martha and Thomas showered Bruce with, the child was at times seen getting lost in his own thoughts, slipping into a profound, inevitable loneliness. That's when he turned to the loyal family butler, Alfred, who happened to be Bruce's nanny, camp counselor, and best friend. All three rolled into one and the duo would spend hours talking to each other. Having said all of that, the boy did have this particular trait. His presence brought out the best in people. Some years passed by, the days of laughter and fun came to an abrupt end when tragedy struck the Wayne family, one that turned Bruce's life upside down. Bruce and his parents were on their way back home post watching The Mark of Zorro when a robber stops them with a gun and starts assaulting them. With the nine-year-old witnessing both his parents getting shot, he is initially helpless and scared. As he calls out to his parents, who are lying still on the ground, he bursts into tears. This irritates the robber enough to point his gun at Bruce and shoot him not once, not twice, but thrice. Of course, this backfires and horribly, may we add, with Bruce being resistant to the bullets, the child's superpowers are seen manifesting for the first time when he burns the robber beyond recognition using his power of heat vision. While a dead and severally charred Joe Chill is discovered the next morning in an alley, the police officers found Bruce that night, smeared with his parents' blood. Bruce had his eyes wide open and kept mumbling the same thing over and over again. The bullets. The bullets. It has been years since that incident. Bruce is an adult now, living isolated in his parents' mansion. It goes without saying that he is still overwhelmed by the guilt and shame of his failure. Alfred is exceedingly worried about him. He wants him to go outside and have experiences. He hates the fact that Bruce hides in the mansion like some kind of a recluse, but his words seem to have no effect on the young man. Bruce's super hearing abilities keep him aware of every crime that's taking place in the city, and it is a given that he simply loathes violence and death with all of his soul. 
His character is also seen collecting newspaper clippings, especially images of murders, violence, and passing them in a locked room. To him, obsessing on another person's loss made him escape his own for the time being. One night, a group of robbers carrying weapons barged into the mansion and held Alfred hostage. This brings back painful memories from the past and Bruce ends up violently attacking them. So much so that he goes to the extent of even tearing some apart using his heat vision. It is post this particular incident that Alfred takes Bruce to a cave nestled right under the Wayne Manor and shows him the rocket, one that brought him to Earth in the first place. Alfred also tells him to go through the journals of Thomas Wayne so as to give him a better idea of his true origins. Upon realizing what he is and grasping the fact that his superpowers will enable him to do an endless number of things, Bruce decides not to punish himself anymore. It finally dawns upon him who he really is and what he is capable of doing. As for the robbers who had invaded the Wayne Manor, two of them were able to make their way back alive to their boss. Of course, their inefficiency and failure at the task given to them annoys the boss to a level where he simply chokes them to death. Two months later, Bruce having taken up the mantle of Batman has not only created his Bat costume, but has also started to fight back against the criminals of Gotham City, making his presence felt as the night vigilante to everyone around. The readers are taken next to a Gotham boardroom where Lex Luthor, a metropolis-based industrialist having moved to Gotham to oversee his interests, is seen illegally trying to acquire Wayne Enterprises by organizing a buyout of the company. But to his shock and everyone present in the boardroom, Bruce arrives split seconds before the agreement is about to be signed. Lex has never seen him so he has no idea who Bruce is and with the latter not giving permission for the buyout, the deal is shut down. Bruce also declares that moving ahead, he will be actively involved with every aspect of his company. Lex is furious and he almost gets into a scuffle with Bruce, but with the latter telling the former that he knows about him surviving a life-threatening chemical explosion. How he took off some time to completely rebuild himself and then venture back into the world, Lex decides not to do anything for the time being. As for Bruce, he didn't just stop at making a public appearance back at his office. He took the next step by purchasing the Gotham Gazette and hiring Perry White as well as Lois Lane from the Daily Planet. Also, FYI, it was Lex who bought out Daily Planet and had Perry canned after losing a libel suit, so now you know Bruce's motive behind joining Gazette as the publisher. Coming back to the duo of Bruce and Lois, while the former gets smitten by her, the latter is surprisingly charmed by his idealism and passion. Sometime later, with Lois chanting upon Lex, she takes up his offer, a ride back home. One conversation leads to the other and Lex is seen trying to slide his hands on her leg. Of course, Lois smacks him hard, warning him not to touch her ever again, but this only lands her getting kicked out of his limo right in the middle of the road and in an unfriendly neighborhood for sure. What follows next is quite predictable. A group of thugs end up attacking her, but Lois gets saved just on time by Batman, who beats the shit out of the gang. However, to Lois, Batman appears to be a dangerous, psychopathic animal. As he comes to help her, an agitated Lois angrily tells him to get away from her. This incident also leads Lois to pin down an article brutally criticizing Batman, highlighting his demeanor. And in case we missed out on an important detail, Lois is also seen beginning a romance with Bruce. After a few weeks pass by, a mysterious man is seen briskly making his way inside the Gazette. While many try to stop him, he simply makes it to Wayne's office. While the man is revealed to be Lex Luthor, there's more to it. He declares his former self dead and embraces his reborn self as the Joker. Hurling Bruce out of the window, he kidnaps Lois and flies away using his little flying machine, whilst mocking Batman at the same time and saying why should he have all the fun. On their way, he divulges more information to Lois about his accident, how he was reduced to a lump of charred, mutilated flesh, and even with surgeons operating on him day and night, they could not be of much help. So, he decided to reinvent himself or, let's say, revamp his look. Lex's plans for Gotham are also revealed. He desires a complete military takeover of the city and addresses Lois as his queen. Having made use of the fortune of LexCorp, Lex had also built up a humongous mercenary army, one with guns, grenades, firebombs, and whatnot. Their conversation gets interrupted by the intervention of Batman, who posts a bit of struggle and is eventually able to foil his plans, captures him, and saves the city from the ensuing chaos, thus revealing himself to be a true hero. Later, as Batman meets Lois, the latter tells him that she saw a different version to Batman this time, one who was capable of setting an example. As she calls him a symbol of hope, Batman tells her that he does not have it in him to either do that or be that, 
Lois takes off his mask and tells him that even if Batman is not capable of doing that, she knows Bruce Wayne is. The duo is seen embracing each other and the issue ends with Bruce Wayne assuming a new mantle, Superman. What do we think of the comic? You know, there is S that stands for Superman speeding bullets, the same way there is an S that stands for spectacular, striking, splendid, as well as stunning. These are precisely what we think of the comic book. Written by Dematis and boasting artwork by Barreto, this graphic novel here is a riot of colors, one with a simple yet intriguing concept. One of the high points of Superman speeding bullets is that the entire storyline is shown from the viewpoint of Lois Lane. What is it that she thinks? But if you ask us the best part, it has to be the ending, one where the writer actually makes Lois wonder how the world would have been had Superman landed somewhere else. We get the pun, Dematis. A very witty one, if we may add. So with that being said, if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone.